Good morning. Happy Easter. Uh, my name is Gavin, lead pastor over at New Springs Church. This is Johnny Moore. Uh, these are strange times. Uh, we really wish we were doing this together and could bring your kids out to do an Easter egg hunt. Hope maybe you bought something online and you're still able to do that. Uh, but here we are. Uh, God is still sovereign. Uh, the fact still remains that he rose on this day some 2,000 years ago. And so we're going to celebrate. Maybe we can't do it together physically, uh, but we can definitely do it together spiritually as we're connected by his spirit. So I'm going to read for us a passage. Um, Johnny will sing a couple songs, and then we'll talk about what Christ has done for us. Here I am in Luke chapter 24. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened, they bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day, rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child He became like the least of us Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the Roaring Lion. Oh, be still and behold him. Dined with sinners and saints, healed the blind and lost and the lame. Even now he is in our midst. Behold him, he who chose a criminal's end, paid with blood to settle our debt. Buried death as he rose to life. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the Roaring Lion. Oh, be still and behold him, Jesus. Alpha and Omega, our God, the risen Savior, oh, be still and behold Him. Messiah, 
the lamb, the roaring lion, oh, be still and behold him, Jesus, Alpha and Omega, our God, the risen Savior, oh, be Let's pray. Father, we thank you um, for the times where we are. Um, we're able to see your goodness all the more because things have changed. And sometimes that, that's what needs to happen. We need a little bit of difficulty uh, to see the light more clearly. And so as we gather together virtually, celebrating Easter in a way that none of us ever had before, just pray that you would minister to us anyway, uh, that you would block out distractions. I know homes can be chaotic at times with uh, kids running around, other things that fill our mind. Sometimes just being in the home reminds you of tasks that you need to complete. But allow us to focus on you in these few moments, that we would be reminded of who you are, of what you've done, and who we are in light of who you are and what you've done. So I ask that you would do that through this text this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For the fun never ends when you give to your friends and you share the wonder of a bright and sunny, sunny, healthy Easter. With painted eggs and jelly beans too. Of all the fun and neat stuff. The candy and the sweet stuff. My favorite Easter wish will come true. When we share this Easter day with you. That's the fun neat stuff. The candy and the sweet stuff. <laughs> and for eight, chase balloons and shout, hip hip hooray. baskets and great big Easter egg hunts. Well, uh, well, Rue, uh, I'm afraid you've been terribly misinformed. Why, this is, this is spring cleaning day, and you've all ruined it! That Winnie the Pooh clip, I love it. Uh, you've got Rabbit and all of his um, Scrooge-like approach to Easter calling it spring cleaning day. And if we aren't careful, uh, we can be a whole lot like rabbit, right? You see people with Easter eggs and baskets and eating peeps and uh, your mindset all of a sudden becomes, well, hey, you've, you've ignored the reality of what Easter is truly about and why we're here. Or maybe you've become rabbit in another sense where now that you're home and you're not going to church in a physical building on Sunday, that you're looking at today is spring cleaning day not really looking out to worship and be drawn into Christ's presence, but now as all the days have blended together, this just becomes another opportunity to clean. Well, if we're right in looking at this, we want to look at it with the, the eyes of Christ. Both Rue, the little kangaroo who set up that nice party, and Rabbit are terribly misunderstood. See, Easter is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that's something worthy of celebration. And so this morning, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's a famous passage. Uh, if you've been in church for any time, I'm sure you've read it before and maybe even know it pretty well. But let's look at it afresh, see what it is that Christ has done for us. So I'm going to be 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, and we'll chat about it together. 
Now, Paul, who's writing this chapter, he says this. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance that what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then all the apostles. Last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me. See, I'm just going to talk about this passage in, in two ways. First, what the gospel is, and then secondly, why we can have confidence in it. If you look back at verses 3 and 4, Paul's going to define exactly what the gospel is. He's pleading with his brothers here in this church in Corinth, a church that reminds me a lot of most churches here in South Florida. Corinth was a wild place of sensuality and licentiousness because they lived on the coast. And so people partied and did what they did. And South Florida reminds me of that. And so what Paul wants to do is he wants to remind this church of what they received from God. He says in verse 1 and 2, you receive this gospel. It's the gospel in which you stand. And it's the gospel by which you are being saved, present tense. So what is it? What is this gospel that causes me to stand firmly? What is this gospel that is causing me to be saved even presently? Well, first, the content of it in verses 3 and 4 are this. Christ died for our sins. It's Good Friday. That's that somber commemoration of Christ on the cross, paying for the sins of humanity. Then verse 4, he's buried. And he's raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the content of the gospel. Now that word, gospel, we use it all the time. You even hear it in the vernacular in uh, popular television and movies, that something is the gospel, meaning that it's the truth. Well, what gospel really means at its core is good news. Now good news, I'm of the belief, is only properly understood in the context of bad news. So for example, if I came to you a summer ago, last year, and I said, hey, the government just released a statement and you're allowed to go to dinner with your family. Man, if this is summer of 2019, you're looking at me like something's wrong with me. What are you talking about? The government released a statement that I can go to dinner with my family. I could always go to dinner with my family. But if I were to give you that news today, how much more powerful does that mean? I'm not representative of the government. I have no authority to give you that message. But us having been locked down, restaurants closed, only doing takeout and delivery, man, when that day comes, when the quarantine is lifted, social distancing comes to an end, and I can take my wife and put my little three-month-old daughter in her car seat, put her in the car, get my son and his toys, put him in his car seat, and just drive across the street and go sit at a restaurant. Enjoy a meal out together. Man, that's good news. Well, what makes it so good is the bad news. All of the stuff we've been going through for the last couple of weeks, man, that's going to be a beautiful day when we're set free once again. Well, that's what we're talking about with the gospel. The gospel is good news in light of news that is really, really terrible. Well, what's the terrible news? It's the fact that you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. And if this is one of your, you know, few experiences with church, maybe you hear that word sinner and you cringe. Well, ah, this, they're, they're judging me. What sinner means is that we're inherently selfish. I think we can all acknowledge that. See, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm primarily looking out for number one. Prior to Christ, it's even worse. Everything that you do, that you think about, that you desire, it's to please yourself. It's to elevate yourself. And so what sin is, is pursuing that at all costs. I'm about me. Well, what God has created all of us to be is to love him first. Matthew chapter 22, I believe it's verse 34. We love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. And the second commandment is not even what you would think. The second commandment isn't love yourself second. 
but love your neighbor as yourself. That means I'm created to love God primarily and then love others at least as much as I love myself. I can only be in second and more likely third place. Nobody thinks like that. And so sin is me continuing to pursue selfishness and desires for me. Well, what, what's the good news then? Well, the good news is that if that's true, I deserve the wrath of God. But by Jesus Christ and what he's done here, verse 3, dying for my sins, dying for my selfishness, dying for me stepping out of line from my design. He died for that. And then he raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. What that means then is as Jesus gets out of the grave, he's doing something that no, man, that no other man can do. See, when you die, it's over, it's final. I think sometimes we lose the finality of that unless it happens to someone who's a loved one. We think about the cross just as some past event in history and oh yeah, Jesus just got back up. That is monumentally impossible. But that's what he did because Jesus is Lord over death. And so what his resurrection does for us, it guarantees that your sins have been forgiven. It guarantees that death has been defeated. And it guarantees that just as he got up, first fruits of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, you will get up as well at the last day. That's incredibly good news in light of me being a sinner do the wrath of God. Well, I think the second thing that Paul does in this passage, not just communicate what the gospel is. Last thing you need, or maybe not last thing, but we don't just need more information. Like this needs to like drill down into your heart so that you get it, you understand it, you believe it, and you walk in it. Well, what that takes oftentimes is confidence. Something's going to be rooted in my belief and cause me to, to, to walk and, and it become part of my character. I've got to really, really believe it and have confidence in it. And I think Paul gives us that confidence in two ways. Look with me at verses 5 through 8. He says that after Jesus rose from the dead, that doesn't happen often, he appeared to Cephas. So Paul names a specific person who saw Jesus. And then to the 12. So he appeared to Peter and then the rest of the disciples. Then, verse 6, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. What's Paul saying there? He's giving us confidence. See, at the time of writing, the people who saw Jesus get up out of the grave, they were still alive. He said, you can go and talk to them, ask them about what they saw. That's literally how our American court system is built. An event happens, if evidence is lacking, go and ask people who were there and they'll tell you what we saw. Imagine a court case where uh, the, the, the defendant has 500 witnesses come in and say, yeah, that really happened. That court case is a slam dunk. You get 500 witnesses, that's an easy case. Well, that's what Paul's saying here. 500 people saw it. Maybe you're a little bit skeptical. You're like, ah, it's this Christian mumbo jumbo. They put together this Bible and it's been edited and tweaked and played with and toyed with. Understand this. 500 people at one time cannot be crazy. You can't all have the same hallucination. See, that's not the way the mind works. If someone's hallucinating, seeing something that uh, isn't really there, that's present only in their mind. That can't be repeated in someone else. So something significant really did happen. I think the second part of that is Paul pointing out that it was the disciples specifically who witnessed this. Now, as you read through the Gospels, you see Jesus gets arrested and Peter, the first guy, Cephas, that Paul names, he runs away. The authorities, they go to find him. They say, hey, I've seen you with Jesus before. Isn't that your boy? Peter says, no, nah, I've never seen him before. Someone else comes along. Hey, I know you. I've seen you with Jesus. No, not me. You got me mistaken. Three times Peter denies Jesus Christ. The day that Jesus is bleeding and dying on the cross, none of his friends are there. They're all hiding. They're accomplices to a criminal who just faced capital punishment. They're afraid. Yet a few weeks later, Acts chapter 2, you see the Holy Spirit, a few days later, you see the Holy Spirit 
descend upon the disciples, and now they are proclaiming the gospel in the streets to the threat of death. Who goes out and spreads a message at the threat of death that they don't genuinely believe? Well, then maybe your objection comes in and says, well, they're probably lying about it. They got together, they coerced, they came up with a plan because this would elevate themselves to a place of prominence and write their names in history. Okay, what's the purpose of lying? Is it not self-preservation? Maybe self-glorification? It's the only reason I would bend the truth. You don't want to get in trouble. Or you bend the truth because you want to elevate yourself to make you better than you possibly are. When somebody says, yeah, that's a great lie, I'm going to kill you for it, that lie is over, right? There's no more self-preservation. There's no more self-glorification because if you die, there is no more self. Nobody takes a lie to the grave. So here we have Paul stating 500 people and the disciples witnessed the exact same thing and they were willing to die for it. That's a confidence that you can have. This is a real historical event. If you believe in George Washington, if you believe in Aristotle, if you believe in the Gallic Wars that Caesar wrote, you better believe in this book because it's substantially confirmed even more than those. Well, secondly, what's more confidence that we can have in the gospel and the promises that come with it? Well, if you look at verses 4 or verses 3 and 4, you see a phrase repeated twice. It's always a good thing to look at phrases that are repeated in the Bible. It's like a megaphone. Pay attention to this. And Paul says that Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. In verse 4, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. What does that phrase mean? The scriptures at that time, the apostles are writing them. So it's not the Bible that you and I have. But their scriptures are the, the contents of the Old Testament, those 39 books. And so what Paul is saying is that by Jesus getting arrested, going to the cross and dying, he's fulfilling what the Old Testament had promised. Well, who cares? Why is that, why is that a significant point? It points to God's faithfulness. See, if God makes a promise and then fulfills it, that, that builds confidence. That's how everything works, right? If you buy a T-shirt off of eBay, you're checking the seller rating. What is the seller rating? Times where he has sold a T-shirt before and the person who bought it actually got the item in good, in, in good condition. And so they give him five stars. And you're like, all right, cool, I'm going to buy a shirt from this guy. The Old Testament is God making promises, fulfilling them, and then going back and saying, look at what I did for you, I'm going to do it again. Well, where in the Old Testament might I find a promise about death and resurrection? There are lots of places, but I just want to draw your attention to one. If you would, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. As you turn there, understand this. Ezekiel was a prophet during the, the Babylonian exile. So the Israelites have literally been taken out of their land. They're put into a foreign land. And not to mention the racial undertones there. They hate these people. They think they're disgusting, live a pagan lifestyle, worship foreign gods. And now they've got to live there because of their own wickedness. And so imagine if you've been taken from your homeland, put into another one amongst people that you're not crazy about. You're wondering where God is in that moment. I mean, we're in the midst of a global pandemic, and we've only been in this spot for about a month. Conversations I've had with many. Loss of hope is creeping in. Despair is creeping in. This exile for the Israelites lasted years. And so what God does, he says, look with me in verse 4. He takes Ezekiel out in this vision. And in this vision, Ezekiel sees this valley. It's filled with dry bones. The imagery is, is of an army being defeated. Maybe you've seen the movie Saving Private Ryan and that compelling scene right at the beginning, D-Day. They arrive on the beach and it's a massacre. Imagine what that beach looked like the next day. This is what it's looking like for Ezekiel. He sees this valley, dry, bo dry bones. There's no life there. And God says this in verse 4. Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. 
And then Ezekiel stands back and watches, and he sees these bones elevate off the ground, and joints and marrow and sinews start to connect together as the bones are coming to life. Verse 9, then God says to Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. And so Ezekiel does it. Again, just pull you back out of it. Ezekiel's talking to bones in this vision. It's what crazy people do, talking to dead things. Ezekiel's speaking the word of God, and the word of God is bringing about life. That's the power of who God is. That's the word of encouragement that he's giving here to Israel. Verse 11, he says this to make it all clear for us. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. So here's what God's promise is. They're off in Babylon. They're believing their hope is gone. They're dead. There's nothing but despair. God has reneged on his promises. He's not going to do what he said he was going to do. Hope gone. Despair in. Fear elevated to its highest level. And God says through Ezekiel, that is not the end for you. I am going to bring these dead bones back to life. Well, then we get Jesus Christ a few hundred years later on a cross in the midst of people without hope. Roman government oppressing them, kidnapping them, harming them. God, where are you? They hadn't heard from a prophet in over 400 years since Malachi. And here comes Jesus. And they've got hope in him. They watch blind men see again. They watch lame men walk, leprosy cured off of the skin. And now all of a sudden he's hanging on a cross. Loss of hope, filled with despair, fear at its highest level. But then Sunday comes and Jesus isn't in the tomb anymore. You heard the passage we read when we first started. Why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? He's not here. He told you what he was going to do. Paul reminds us, 1 Corinthians 15, this is done in accordance with the scriptures. See, God's promising to us, even in that Ezekiel 37 passage, that it doesn't end with dry bones. It doesn't. For the people of God, it never ends with death and dry bones. It ends with eternal life, with a holy city, with a new Jerusalem, with the Lord Jesus Christ descending from the clouds, rising from the dead, all who are with him, and we reign alongside of him for all eternity. That's what the resurrection is about. And so if you find yourself losing hope, giving in to despair, shackled to your fears, trust in these words of God. We've got the confidence that 500 people watch Jesus walk around. We've got the confidence that God is fulfilling scripture yet again, as he always has. And so if you find yourself as a child of God, you believe in him, you trust in him, the Holy Spirit has entered your heart, brought it from stone to flesh, then this is your fate. Jesus is merely an example of exactly what's going to happen to you because you're connected in him. And so the reason we've got pastels and bright shining colors on Easter eating marshmallows is because we're happy. We're happy that eternal life belongs to us by the sacrifice of our Lord, by his conquering death. And so if that message brings you hope, I pray that you would give that hope to another. Before I close out, I want to encourage you. Let this, don't let this be a one-time thing. Hey, I'm Easter. It's Easter. I'm at home. I'm dialed in online. I'm watching a live video. I'm going to do it today because I would normally go to church on a Sunday anyway. I encourage you to keep this up. Keep doing it. We've got Zoom groups that meet on Wednesday and Thursday nights. You can connect with us. The links uh, will, will be provided in the description. You can find us again next Sunday live stream. We're going to talk about exactly what the church is for the next five weeks. But most importantly, turn to Christ. Acknowledge your sinfulness, the bad news. I'm selfish. I've sinned against God. I deserve wrath. But I trust you, Jesus. I trust that you died and you rose for me. And I promise you, you will be saved. And you'll be just like those bones that got up and breath entered them and walked into eternal life. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for Easter morning, the most beautiful morning of all time, where sin and death were defeated and new life emerged. I thank you for the new life that you've given me. I thank you for the new life that you've given my family and my friends. And I pray for new life to continue. Doesn't matter what's going on outside of here. New life, eternal life in Christ is promised to all who trust in him. Pray that you would draw us to it, and I thank you for giving it. In Jesus' name, amen. The humble king has come to earth From throne on high to lowly birth His glory reigns The spotless lamb has washed away Our fatal sin with saving grace his glory reigns The man of sorrows crucified For love he bleeds and love he dies His glory reigns Christ the As I said, don't let this be a one-time thing. If you watched us on Good Friday, we talked a little bit about how Jesus Christ on the cross is bringing about sanctification in us. That simply means that by his Holy Spirit, he's working in our hearts to make us more like him. Now, that can't happen in isolation. The temptation is going to be to just, to just hide, to, to retreat back into just Netflix and Amazon and surviving each day. But if you'd like for your spirit to thrive, uh, to be filled with the hope of Christ each and every day, well then pursue him. He'll reward you for that. And so you can join us in our Zoom groups on Thursday night as we discuss some scriptures together for an hour and encourage one another, pray for one another. If you're a man, we get together Saturday morning, 7 a.m., also on Zoom. You can do that from anywhere. And then next week, Sunday, again, we'll be live at 10 a.m. on Facebook and on YouTube, starting a series on the church. And maybe you're wondering about what is church and how do we do church? 
I can't get in my car and go anywhere, so is, does the church cease? Well, it absolutely doesn't, and so our hope is to walk you through and guide you exactly what the church is through the next five weeks, and so I hope that you would come back and join us. Jesus Christ is the author of that book we just preached from, and he's ministering to you through it. Let me leave you with this blessing. Let the grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ fill you with wonder and worship throughout this week. Amen.